together delightedly. I'm glad of that, she exclaimed. It makes me quite happy to be so near my old friends. The scarecrow I told you of, Belina, is the king of the land of Oz. Pardon me, he is not the king now, said the tick said Tick Tock. Well, he was when I left there, declared Dorothy. I know, said Tick Tock, but there is a revolution in the land of Oz, and the scarecrow was deposed by a soldier woman named Ginger uh, General Ginger. And then Ginger was deposed by a little girl named Ozma, who was the rightful heir to the throne, and now rules the land under the title of Ozma of Oz. That is new to me, said Dorothy thoughtfully. But I suppose lots of things have happened since I left the land of Oz. I wonder what has become to the, of the Scarecrow and of the Tin Woodman and the Cowardly Lion. And I wonder who this girl Ozma is, for I never heard of her before. But Tick Tock did not reply to this. He had turned around again to resume his thinking. Dorothy packed the rest of the food back into the pail so as not to be wasteful of good things, and the yellow hen forgot her dignity far enough to pick up all of the scattered crumbs which she ate rather greedily, although she had so lately pretended to despise the things that Dorothy preferred as food. By this time, Tick-Tock approached them with his stiff bow. "'Be kind enough to follow me,' he said, "'and I will lead you away from here to the town of Evna." where you will be more comfortable, and also I will protect you from the wheelers. All right, answered Dorothy promptly. I'm ready. I'm getting low on tea. Chapter 6. The Heads of Langwider. Oh, that Langwider? I think it's Langwider. They walked slowly down the path toward the rocks, Tick-Tock going first, Dorothy following him, and the yellow hen trotting along last of all. At the foot of the path, the copper man leaned down and tossed aside with ease the rocks that encumbered the way. Then he turned to Dorothy and said, Let me carry your dinner pail. She placed it in his right hand at once, and the copper fingers closed firmly over the stout handle. Then the little procession marched out upon the level sands. As soon as the three wheelers who were guarding the mound saw them, they began to shout their wild cries and rolled swiftly toward the little group, as if to capture them or bar their way. But when the foremost had approached near enough, Tick-Tock swung the knitter and pail and struck the wheeler a sharp blow over his head with a queer weapon. Perhaps... It did not hurt very much, but it made a great noise, and the wheeler uttered a howl and tumbled over upon its side. The next minute it scrambled to its wheels and rolled away as fast as it could, screeching with fear at the same time. I told you they were harmless, began Tick-Tock, but before he could say more, another wheeler was upon them. Crack went the dinner pail against its head, knocking its straw hat a dozen feet away, and that was enough for this wheeler also. It rolled away after the first one, and the third did not wait to be pounded with the pail, but joined its fellows as quickly as its wheels would whirl. The yellow hen gave a cackle of delight, and flying to a perch upon Tick-Tock's shoulder, she said, Bravely done, my copper friend, and wisely thought of, too. Now we are free from those ugly creatures. But just then a large band of wheelers came from the forest, and replying, uh, relying upon their numbers to conquer, they advanced fiercely upon Tick-Tock. Dorothy grabbed Belina in her arms and held her tight, and the machine embraced the form of a, the little girl with his left arm, the better to protect her. Then the wheelers were upon them. Rattling bang, bang went the dinner pail in every direction, and it made so much clatter bumping against the heads of the wheelers that they were much more frightened than hurt and fled in a great panic. All that is, except for their leader. This wheeler had stumbled against another and fallen flat upon his back, and before he could, could get his wheels under him to rise again, Tick-Tock had fastened his copper fingers into the neck of the gorgeous jacket of his foe and held him fast. "'Tell your people to go away,' commanded the machine. The leader of the wheelers hesitated to give this order, so Tick-Tock shook him in, as a terrier dog does a rat, and does, until the wheeler's teeth rattled together with a noise like hailstones on a window pane. 
then, as soon as the creature got its breath, it shouted to the others to roll away, which they immediately did. Now, said Tick-Tock, you shall come with us and tell me what I want to know. You'll be sorry you treated me this way, whined the wheeler. I'm a terribly fierce person. As for that, answered Tick-Tock, I am only a machine and cannot feel sorrow or joy, no matter what happens. But you were wrong to think yourself terrible or fierce. Why so? asked the wheeler. Because no one else thinks as you do. Your wheels make you helpless to injure anyone, for you have no fists and cannot scratch or even pull hair. Now, have you any feet to kick with, nor have you any feet to kick with? All you can do is yell and shout, and that does not hurt anyone at all. The wheeler burst into a flood of tears, so to Dorothy's great surprise. Now I and my people are ruined forever, he sobbed, for you have discovered our secret. Being so helpless, our only hope is to make people afraid of us by pretending we are very fierce and terrible, and writing in the sand warnings to beware the wheelers. Until now we have frightened everybody, but since you have discovered our weakness, our enemy will fall upon us and make us very miserable and unhappy. Oh no, exclaimed Dorothy, who was sorry to see this beautifully dressed wheeler so miserable. Tick Tock will keep your secret, and so will Bellina and I. Only we must, uh, you must promise not to try to frighten children any more if they come near to you. I won't, indeed I won't, promised the wheeler, ceasing to cry and becoming more cheerful. I'm not really bad, you know, but we have to pretend to be terrible in order to prevent others from attacking us. That is not exactly true, said Tick-Tock, starting to walk forward uh, toward the path through the forest, and still holding fast to his prisoner, he ro who rolled slowly along beside him. You and your people are full of mischief, and like to bother those who fear you, and you are often impudent and disagreeable, too. But if you will try to cure those faults, I will not tell anyone how helpless you are. I'll try, of course, replied the wheeler eagerly, and thank you, Mr. Tick-Tock, for your kindness. I am only a machine, said Tick-Tock. I cannot be kind any more than I can be sorry or glad. I can only do what I am wound up to do. Are you wound up to keep my secret? asked the wheeler anxiously. Yes, if you behave yourself. But tell me, who rules the king of e land of Ev now? asked the machine. There is no ruler, was the answer, because... Every member of the royal family is imprisoned by the Gnome King, but the Princess Languideer, uh, yeah, I did say that right, but the Princess Languideer, who is a niece of our late King Evoldo, lives in a part of the royal palace and takes as much money out of the royal treasury as she can spend. The Princess Languideer is not exactly a ruler, you see, because she doesn't rule, but she is the nearest approach to a ruler we have at present. I do not remember her, said Tick-Tock. What does she look like? That I cannot say, replied the wheeler, although I have seen her twenty times, for the Princess Languideer is a different person every time I see her, and the only way her subjects can recognize her is that all, uh, at all is by means of a beautiful ruby key which she always wears on a chain attached to her left wrist. When we see the, uh, when we see the key, we know we are beholding the princess. That is strange, said Dorothy in astonishment. Do you mean to say that so many different princesses are one and the same person? Not exactly, answered the wheeler. There is, of course, but one princess, but she appears to us in many forms, which are all more or less beautiful. She must be a witch, exclaimed the girl. I do not think so, declared the wheeler, but there is some mystery connected with her nevertheless. She is a very vain creature, and lives mostly in a room surrounded by mirrors, so that she could admire herself whichever way she looks. No one answered this speech, because they had just passed out of the forest, and their attention was fixed upon the scene before them, a beautiful vale in which there were many fruit trees and green fields, with pretty farmhouses scattered here and there, and broad, smooth roads that led in every direction. In the center of this lovely vale, about a mile from where our friends were standing, rose the tall spires of the royal palace, which glittered brightly against their background of blue sky. The palace was surrounded by charming grounds, full of flowers and shrubbery. 
several thinking fount uh, tinkling fountains could be seen, and there were pleasant walks bordered by rows of white marble statuary. All of these details Dorothy was, of course, unable to notice or admire until they had advanced among the road to a position quite near to the palace, and she was still looking at the pretty sights when her little party entered the grounds and approached the big front door of the king's own apartments. To their disappointment, they found the door tightly closed. A sign was tacked to the panel, which read as follows. Owner absent. Please knock at the third door in the left wing. Now, said Tick-Tock to the captive wheeler, you must show us the way to the left wing. Very well, agreed the prisoner. It is around here at the right. How can the left wing be at the right, demanded Dorothy, who feared the, the wheeler was fooling them. Because there used to be three wings, and two were torn down, so the one on the right is the only one left. It is a trick of the princess Languidere to prevent visitors from annoying her. Then the captive led them around to the wing, after which the machine man, having no further use for the wheeler, permitted him to depart and rejoin his fellows. He immediately rolled away at a great pace, and was soon lost to sight. Tick-tock now counted the door in a wing and, uh... Tick-Tock now counted the doors in the wing and knocked loudly upon the third one. It was opened by a little maid in a cap trimmed by gay ribbons, who bowed respectfully and said, Who do you wish, uh, what do you wish, good people? Are you the Princess Languidere? asked Dorothy. No, miss, I am her servant, replied the maid. May I see the princess, please? I will tell her you are here, miss, and ask her to grant you an audience, said the maid. Step in, please, and take a seat in the drawing room. So Dorothy walked in, followed closely by the machine. But as the yellow hen tried to enter after them, the little maid cried, Shoo! and flapped her apron in Bellina's face. Shoo yourself, reported the hen, drawing back in anger and ruffling up her feathers. Haven't you any better manners than that? Oh, do you talk? inquired the maid, evidently surprised. Can't you hear me? snapped Bellina. Drop that apron and get out of the doorway so that I may enter with my friends. The princess won't like it, said the maid, hesitating. I don't care whether she likes it or not, replied Bellina, and fluttering her wings with a loud noise, she flew straight at the maid's face. The little servant at once ducked her head, and the hen reached Dorothy's side in safety. Very well, sighed the maid. If you are all ruined because of this obstinate hen, don't blame me for it. It isn't safe to annoy the Princess Languidere. Tell her we are waiting, if you please, Dorothy requested with dignity. Bellina is my friend and must go wherever I go. Without more words, the maid led them to a richly furnished drawing room, lighted with subdued rainbow tints that came in through beautiful stained glass windows. Remain here, she said. What names shall I give the princess? I'm Dorothy Gale of Kansas, replied the girl, and this gentleman is a machine named Tick-Tock, and the yellow hen is my friend Bellina. The little servant bowed and withdrew, going through several passages and mounting two marble staircases before she came to the apartments occupied by her mistress. Princess Languidere's sitting room was paneled with great mirrors, which reached from the ceiling to the floor. Also the ceiling was composed of mirrors, and the floor was of polished silver that reflected every object upon it. So when Languidere sat in her easy chair and played soft melodies upon her mandolin, her form was mirrored hundreds of times in walls and ceiling and floors and which uh, ever way the lady turned her head, she could see and admire her own features. This she loved to do, and just as the maid entered, she was saying to herself, This head with the auburn hair and hazel eyes is quite attractive. I must wear it more often than I have done of late, although it may not be the best of my collection. You have company, your highness, announced the maid, bowing low. Who is it? asked the languidier, yawning. Dorothy Gale of Tick-Tock, Mr. Uh, who? Dorothy Gale of Kansas, Mr. Tick-Tock, and Bellina, answered the maid. What a queer lot of names, murmured the princess, beginning to be a little interested. What are they like, this Dorothy Gale of Kansas pretty? 
She might be called so, the maid replied. And is Mr. Tick-Tock attractive? continued the princess. That I cannot say, your highness, but he seems very bright. Will your, uh, will your gracious highness see them? Oh, I may as well, Nanda, but I'm tired. Uh, I am tired admiring this head, and if my visitor has any claim to beauty, I must take care that she does not surpass me. So I will go to my cabinet and change into number 17, which I think is my best appearance, don't you? Your number 17 is exceedingly beautiful, answered Nanda with another bow. Again the princess yawned. Then she said, Help me to rise. So the maid assisted her to gain her feet, although Languideer was the stronger of the two, and then the princess slowly walked across the silver floor to her cabinet, leaning heavily at every step upon Nanda's arm. Now I must explain to you that Princess Languideer had thirty heads, as many as there are days in the month. But, of course, she could only wear one of them at a time, because she had but one neck. These heads were kept in what she called her cabinet, which was a beautiful dressing room that lay just between Languideer's sleeping chamber and the mirrored sitting room. Each head was in a separate cardboard uh, cupboard lined with velvet. The cupboards ran all around the sides of the dressing room and had elaborately carved doors with gold numbers on the side, the jeweled framed mirrors on, uh, and jeweled framed mirrors on the inside of them. When the princess got out of her crystal bed in the morning, she went to her cabinet, opened one of the velvet-lined cupboards, and took the head it contained from its golden shelf. Then, by the aid of the mirror inside the open door, she put on the head, as neat and straight as could be, and afterward called her maids to robe her for the day. She always wore a simple white costume that suited all the heads, for, being able to change her face whenever she liked, the princess had no interest in wearing a variety of gowns, as have uh, other ladies who are compelled to wear the same face constantly. Of course, the thirty heads were in great variety, no two formed alike, but all being of exceeding loveliness. There were heads of golden hair, brown hair, rich auburn hair, and black hair, but none with gray hair. The heads had eyes of blue, of gray, of hazel, of brown, and of black, but there were no red eyes among them, and all were bright and handsome. The noses were Grecian, Roman, retrousse, and oriental, representing all types of beauty, and the mouths were of assorted sizes and shapes, displaying pearly teeth from the heads uh, when the heads smiled. As for dimples, they appeared in cheeks and chins whenever they might be most charming, and one or two heads had freckles upon the faces to contrast the better with the brilliancy of their complexions. One key unlocked all the velvet cupboards containing their, these treasures, a curious key carved from a, sil a single blood-red ruby, and this was fastened to a strong but slender chain which the princess wore around her left wrist. When Nanda had supported Languideer to a position in front of number 17, the princess unlocked the door with her ruby key, and after handing head number 9, which she had been wearing, to the maid, she took number 17 from its shelf and fitted it to her neck. It had black hair and dark eyes and a lovely pearl and white complexion, and when Languideer wore it, she knew she was remarkably beautiful in appearance. There was only one trouble with number 17, the temper that went with it, and which was hidden somewhere under the glossy black hair, was fiery, harsh, and haughty in the extreme, and it often led the princess to do unpleasant things which she regretted when she came to wear her other heads. But she did not remember this today, and went to meet her guests in the drawing room with a feeling of certainty that she would surprise them with her beauty. However, she was greatly disappointed to find that her visitors were merely a small girl in a gingham dress, a copper man that would only go when wound up, and a yellow hen that was sitting contentedly in Languideer's best work basket, where there was a china egg used for darning stockings. Oh! said Languideer, slightly lifting the nose of number 17. I thought someone of importance had called. Then you were right, declared Dorothy. I'm a good deal of importance myself, and when Bellina lays her eggs, she has the proudest cackle you ever heard. As for Tick-Tock, he's the stop, stop, 
commanded the princess, with an angry flash of her splendid eyes. How dare you annoy me with your senseless chatter? Why, you horrible thing, said Dorothy, who was not accustomed to being treated so rudely. The princess looked at her more closely. Tell me, she resumed, are you of royal blood? Better than that, ma'am, said Dorothy, I came from Kansas. "'cried the princess scornfully. "'You are a foolish child, and I can allow you to annoy me. "'Run away, you little goose, and bother someone else.' "'Dorothy was so indignant that for a moment "'she could find no words to reply, "'but she rose from her chair and was about to leave the room "'when the princess, who had been scanning the girl's face, "'stopped her by saying more gently, "'Come nearer to me.' Dorothy obeyed without a thought of fear, and stood before the princess while Languidere examined her face with careful attention. "'You are rather attractive,' said the lady presently. "'Not at all beautiful, you understand, but you have a certain style of prettiness that is different from that of any of my thirty heads. So I believe I'll take your head and give you number twenty-six for it.' "'I believe you will not,' replied Dorothy. "'It will do you no good to refuse,' continued the princess, "'for I need your head for my collection, "'and in the land of Ev my will is law. "'I never have cared much for number twenty-six, "'and you will find that it is very little worn. "'Besides, it will do you just as well as the one you are wearing "'for all practical purposes.' "'I don't know anything about your number twenty-six, "'but I don't want it,' said Dorothy firmly. "'I'm not used to taking cast-off things, "'so I'll just keep my own head.' "'You refuse?' said the princess with a frown. "'Of course I do,' was the reply. "'Then,' said Languidere, "'I shall lock you up in a tower until you decide to obey me. "'Nanda?' turning to her maid. "'Call my army!' "'Nanda rang the silver bell, "'and at once a big fat colonel in a bright red uniform entered the room, "'followed by ten lean soldiers, who all looked sad and discouraged, "'and saluted the princess in a very melancholy fashion.' "'Carry that girl to the North Tower and lock her up,' cried the princess, pointing to Dorothy. "'To hear is to obey,' answered the big red colonel, and caught the child by her arm. "'But at that moment Tick-Tock raised his dinner-pail and pounded it so forcibly against the colonel's head "'that the big officer sat down upon the floor with a sudden thump, looking both dazed and very much astonished.' Help! he shouted, and the ten lean soldiers sprang to assist their leader. There was great excitement for the next few moments, and Tick-Tock had knocked down seven of the army, who were sprawling in every direction upon the carpet, when suddenly the machine paused. With the dinner pail raised for another blow, and remained perfectly motionless. My action has run down, he called to Dorothy. Wind me up quick! She tried to obey, but the big colonel had by this time managed to get upon his feet again, so he grabbed fast hold of the girl, and she was helpless to escape. "'This is too bad,' said the machine. "'I ought to have run six hours longer, at least, but I suppose my long walk and my fight with the wheelers have made me run down faster than usual.' "'Well, it can't be helped,' said Dorothy with a sigh. "'Will you exchange head with, heads with me?' demanded the princess." "'No, indeed!' cried Dorothy. "'Then lock her up,' said Languidere to her soldiers, and they led Dorothy to a high tower at the north of the palace, and locked her securely within. The soldiers afterward tried to lift Tick-Tock, but they found the machine so solid and heavy that they could not stir it. So they left him standing in the center of the drawing-room. "'People will think I have a nice new statue,' said Languidere. "'So it won't matter in the least, and Nanda can keep him well-polished.' "'What shall we do with a hen?' asked the colonel, who had just discovered Bellina in the work-basket. "'Put her in the chicken-house,' answered the princess. "'Some day I'll have her fried for breakfast.' "'She looks rather tough, your majesty,' said Nanda, doubtfully. "'That is base slander!' cried Bellina, struggling frantically in the colonel's arms. "'But the breed of chicken I come from is said to be poison to all princesses.' Then, remarked Languidere, I will not fry the hen, but keep her to lay eggs, and if she does not do her duty, I'll have her drowned in the horse trough. Chapter 7. Ozma of Oz to the Rescue 
Nanda brought Dorothy bread and water for her supper, and she slept upon a hard stone couch with a single pillow and a silken coverlet. In the morning she leaned out of the window of her prison in the tower to see if there was any way to escape. The room was not so very high up when compared with our modern buildings, but it was far enough above the trees and farmhouses to give her a good view of the surrounding country. To the east she saw the forest with the sands beyond it and the ocean beyond that. There was even a dark speck upon the shore that she thought might be the chicken coop in which she had arrived in this singular country. Then she looked to the north and saw a deep but narrow valley lying between two rocky mountains and a third mountain that shut off the valley at the further end. Westward the fertile land of Ev suddenly ended a little way from the palace and the girl could see miles and miles of sandy desert that stretched farther than her eyes could reach. It was this desert, she thought, with much interest, that alone separated her from the wonderful land of Oz, and she remembered sorrowfully that she had been told no one had ever been able to cross this dangerous waste but herself. Once a cyclone had carried her, uh, carried her across it, and a magical pair of silver shoes had carried her back again. But now she had neither a cyclone nor silver shoes to assist her, and her condition was sad indeed for she had become the prisoner of a disagreeable princess who insisted that she must exchange her head for another one that she was not used to, and which might not fit her at all. Really, there seemed no hope to, uh, no hope of help for her from her old friends in the land of Oz. Thoughtfully, she gazed from her window on all the desert. Not a single thing was stirring. Wait, though. Something surely was stirring on the desert, something her eyes had not observed at first. Now it seemed like a cloud. Now it seemed like a pot of, spot of silver. Now it seemed to be a mass of rainbow colors that moved swiftly toward her. What could it be, she wondered. Then, gradually, but in a brief space of time nevertheless, the vision drew near enough to Dorothy to make out what it was. A broad green carpet was unrolling itself upon the desert. While advancing across the carpet was a wonderful procession that made the girl open her eyes in amazement as she gazed. First came a magnificent golden chariot drawn by a great lion and an immense tiger who stood shoulder to shoulder and trotted along as gracefully as a well-matched team of thoroughbred horses. And standing upright within the chariot was a beautiful girl clothed in flowing robes of silver gauze and wearing a jeweled diadem upon her dainty head. She held in one hand the satin ribbons that guided her astonishing team, and in the other an ivory wand that separated at the top into two prongs, the prongs being tipped by the letters O and Z, made of the glittering diamonds so closely together. The girl seemed neither older nor larger than Dorothy herself, and at once the prisoner in the tower guessed that the lovely driver of the chariot must be that Ozma of Oz of whom she had so lately heard from Tick-Tock. Following closely behind the chariot, Dorothy saw her old friend the Scarecrow riding calmly astride a wooden sawhorse, which pranced and trotted as naturally as any meat horse could have done. And then came Nip. Nick Chopper, the tin woodman, with his funnel-shaped cap tipped carelessly over his left ear, his gleaming axe over his right shoulder, and his whole body sparkling as brightly as it had ever done in the old days when first she knew him. The tin woodman was on foot, marching at the head of a company of twenty-seven soldiers, of whom some were lean and some were fat, some short and some tall, but all the twenty-seven were dressed in handsome uniforms of various designs and colors, no two being alike in any respect. Behind the soldiers, the green carpet rolled itself up again, so that there was always just enough of it for the procession to walk upon in order that their feet might not come in contact with the deadly, life-destroying sands of the desert. Dorothy knew at once it was a magic carpet she beheld, and her heart beat high with hope and joy as she realized she was soon to be rescued and allowed the great, uh, to greet her dearly beloved friends of Oz, the Scarecrow, the Tin Woodman, and the Cowardly Lion. Indeed, the girl felt herself as good as rescued as soon as she recognized those in the procession, for she knew 
well the courage and loyalty of her old comrades, and also believed that any others who came from their marvelous country would prove to be pleasant and reliable acquaintances. As soon as the last bit of desert was passed and all the procession from the beauty and dainty Ozma to the last soldier had reached the grassy meadows of the land of Ev, the magic carpet rolled itself together and entirely disappeared. Then the chariot driver turned her lion and tiger into a broad roadway leading up to the palace, and the others followed while Dorothy, still gazing from her tower window in eager excitement. They came quite close to the front door of the palace and then halted, the scarecrow dismounting from his sawhorse to approach the sign fastened to the door that he might read what it said. Dorothy, just above him, could keep silent no longer. "'Here I am!' she shouted as loudly as she could. "'Here's Dorothy!' "'Dorothy who?' asked Scarecrow, tipping his head to look upward until he nearly lost his balance and tumbled over backward. "'Dorothy Gale, of course, your friend from Kansas,' she answered. "'Why, hello, Dorothy,' said the Scarecrow. "'What in the world are you doing up there?' "'Nothing,' she called down, "'because there's nothing to do. "'Save me, my friend! Save me!' "'You seem to be quite safe now,' replied the Scarecrow. "'But I'm a prisoner. I'm locked in so I can't get out,' she pleaded. "'That's all right,' said the Scarecrow. "'You might be worse off, little Dorothy. Just consider the matter. "'You can't get drowned, or be run over by a wheeler, or fall out of an apple tree. "'Some folks would say you were lucky to be up there.' "'Well, I don't,' declared the girl. "'And I want to get down immediately and see you and the Tin Woodman and the Cowardly Lion.' "'Very well,' said the Scarecrow, nodding. "'It shall be just as you say, little friend. "'Who locked you up?' "'The Princess Languidere, who is a horrid creature,' she answered. "'At this, Ozma, who had been listening carefully to the conversation, "'called to Dorothy from her chariot, asking, "'Why did the Princess lock you up, my dear?' "'Because,' exclaimed Dorothy, "'I wouldn't let her have my head for her collection "'and take an old out a cast-off head in exchange for it.' "'I do not blame you,' exclaimed Princess. Ozma promptly. I will see the princess in once and oblige her to liberate you. Oh, thank you very much, cried Dorothy, as uh, who, as soon as she heard the sweet voice of the girlish ruler of Oz, knew that she would soon learn to love her dearly. Ozma now drove her chariot around to the front. Uh, sorry. Ozma now drove her chariot around to the third door of the wing, upon which the tin woodman boldly proceeded to knock. As soon as the maid opened the door, Ozma, bearing in her hand her ivory wand, stepped into the hall and made her way at once to the drawing room, followed by all of her company, except the lion and the tiger. And the twenty-seven soldiers made such a noise and a clatter that the little maid Nanda ran away screaming to her mistress, whereupon the princess Languidere, roused to great anger by this rude invasion of her palace came running into the drawing room without any assistance whatever there she stood before the slight and delicate form of the little girl from oz and cried out how dare you enter my palace unbidden leave this room at once or i will b bind you and all your people in chains and throw you into my darkest dungeon what a dangerous lady murmured the scarecrow in a soft voice she seems a little nervous replied the tin woodman but Ozma only smiled at the angry princess. "'Sit down, please,' she said quietly. "'I have traveled a long way to see you, and you must listen to what I have to say.' "'Must!' screamed the princess, her black eyes flashing with fury, for she still wore a number seventeen head. "'Must to me!' "'To be sure,' said Ozma. "'I am ruler of the land of Oz, and I am powerful enough to destroy all your kingdom.' If I so wish, yet I did not come here to do harm, but rather to free the royal family of Ev from the thrall of the Gnome King. The news have reached me that he is holding the queen and her prince, uh, children prisoner. Hearing these words, Languidere suddenly became quiet. I wish you could indeed free my aunt and her ten royal children, she said eagerly, for if they were restored to their proper forms and station, they could rule the king kingdom of Ev themselves, and that would save me a lot of worry and trouble. At present there are at least ten minutes every day that I must devote to affairs of state, and I would like to be able to spend my whole time in admiring my beautiful heads. 
Then we will presently discuss this matter, said Ozma, and try to find a way to liberate my aunt and uh, your aunt and cousins. But first you must liberate another prisoner, the little girl you have locked up in your tower. Of course, said Languideer readily. I'd forgotten all about her. That was yesterday, you know, and a princess cannot be expected to remember today what she did yesterday. Come with me, and I will rescue the prisoner at once. So Ozma followed her, and they passed up the stairs that led to the room in the tower. While they were gone, Ozma's followers remained in the drawing room, and the scarecrow was leaning against a form that he had mistaken for a copper statue, when a harsh metallic voice said suddenly in his ear, Get off my foot, please. You are scratching my polish. Oh, excuse me, he replied, hastily drawing back. Are you alive? No, said Tick-Tock. I am only a machine, but I can think and speak and act when I am properly wound up. Just now my action is run down, and Dorothy has the key to it. That's all right, replied the Scarecrow. Dorothy will soon be free, and then we'll attend to your, uh, she'll attend to your works. But it must be a great misfortune not to be alive. I'm sorry for you. Ah, uh, why? asked Tick-Tock. Because you have no brains, as I have, said Scarecrow. Oh, yes, I have, returned Tick-Tock. I am fitted with Smith and Tinker's improved combination steel brains. They are what make me think. What sort of brains are you fitted with? I don't know, admitted the Scarecrow. They were given me by the great Wizard of Oz, and I didn't get a chance to examine them before he put them in. But they work splendidly, and my conscience is very active. Have you a conscience? No, said Tick-Tock. And no heart, I suppose, added Tin Woodman, who had been listening with interest to this conversation. No. Then, continued the Tin Woodman, I regret to say that you are greatly inferior to my friend the Scarecrow and to myself, for we are both alive, and he has brains which do not need to be wound up, while I have an excellent heart that is continually beating in my bosom. I congratulate you, replied Tick-Tock. I cannot help being your inferior, as I am a mere machine. When I am wound up, I do my duty by going just by, uh, just as my machinery is made to go. You have no idea how full of machinery I am. I can guess, said Scarecrow, looking at the machine man curiously. Some day I'd like to take you apart and see just how you are made. Do not do that, I beg, said Tick-Tock, for you could not put me together again, and my use uh, and... My usefulness would be destroyed. Oh, are you useful? asked the si Scarecrow, surprised. Very, said Tick-Tock. In that case, the Scarecrow kindly promised, I won't fool with your interior at all, for I am a poor, uh, for I am a poor mechanic and might mix you up. Thank you, said Tick-Tock. Just then, Ozma re-entered the room, leading Dorothy by the hand and followed closely by Princess Languideer. Chapter 8 The Hungry Tiger The first thing Dorothy did was to rush into the embrace of the scarecrow, who painted, whose painted face beamed with delight as he pressed her form to his straw-padded bosom. Then the tin woodman embraced her very gently, for he knew his tin arms might hurt her if he squeezed too roughly. These greetings having been exchanged, Dorothy took the key to Tick-Tock from his pocket and wound up the machine man's action so that he could bow properly when introduced to the rest of the company. While doing this, she told them how useful Tick-Tock had been to her, and both the Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman shook hands with the machine once more and thanked him for protecting their friend. Then Dorothy asked, "'Where's Bellina?' "'I don't know,' said the Scarecrow. "'Who's Bellina?' "'She's a yellow hen who is another friend of mine,' answered the girl anxiously. "'I wonder what has become of her.' "'She is in the kitchen house, uh, ki uh, chicken house in the backyard,' said the princess. "'My drawing room is no place for hens.' "'Without waiting to hear more, Dorothy ran to get Bellina, "'and just outside the door she came upon the cowardly lion, "'still hitched to the chariot beside the great tiger. "'The cowardly lion had a big bow of blue ribbon "'fastened to the long hair between his ears,' and the tiger wore a bow of red ribbon on his tail, just in front of the bushy end. In an instant, Dorothy was hugging the huge lion joyfully. "'I'm so glad to see you again!' she cried. 
I am also glad to see you, Dorothy, said the lion. We've had some fine adventures together, haven't we? Yes, indeed, she replied. How are you? As cowardly as ever, the beast answered in a meek voice. Every little thing scares me and makes my heart beat fast. But let me introduce you to my new friend, the hungry tiger. Oh, are you hungry? she asked, turning to the other beast, who was just then yawning so widely that he displayed two rows of terrible teeth and a mouth big enough to startle anyone. Dreadfully hungry, answered the tiger, napping his jaws together with a fierce clack. Then why don't you eat something, she asked. It's no use, said the tiger sadly. I've tried that, but I always get hungry again. Why, it is the same with me, said Dorothy, yet I keep on eating. But you eat harmless things, so it doesn't matter, replied the tiger. For my part, I am a savage beast and have an appetite for all sorts of poor little living creatures, from a chipmunk to fat babies. How dreadful, said Dorothy. "'Isn't it, though?' returned the hungry tiger, licking his lips with his long red tongue. "'Fat babies, don't they sound delicious? "'But I've never eaten any, because my conscience tells me it is wrong. "'If I had no conscience, I would probably eat the babies and then get hungry again, "'which would mean that I had sacrificed the poor babies for nothing. "'No, hungry I was born, and hungry I shall die, "'but I'll not have any cruel deeds on my conscience to be sorry for.' I think you are a very good tiger, said Dorothy, patting the huge head of the beast. In that you are mistaken, was the reply. I am a good beast, perhaps, but a disgracefully bad tiger, for it is the nature of tigers to be cruel and ferocious, and in refusing to eat harmless living creatures, I am acting as no good tiger has ever before acted. That is why I left the forest and joined my friend, the cowardly lion. "'But the lion is not really cowardly,' said Dorothy. "'I have seen him act as bravely as can be.' "'All a mistake, my dear,' protested the lion gravely. "'To others I may have seemed brave at times, "'but I have never been in any danger that I was not afraid.' "'Nor I,' said Dorothy truthful, truthfully. "'But I must go and set free, Bellina, and then I will see you again.' She ran around to the backyard of the palace and soon found the chicken house, being guided to it by a loud cackling and crowing and a distracting hubbub of sounds such as chickens make when they are excited. Something seemed to be wrong in the chicken house, and when Dorothy looked through the slats in the door, she saw a group of hens and roosters huddled in one corner and watching what appeared to be a whirling ball of feathers. It bounded here and there about the chicken house, and at first Dorothy could not tell what it was, while the screeching of the chickens nearly deafened her. But suddenly the bunch of feathers stopped whirling, and then to her amazement the girl saw Bellina, crouching upon the prostrate form of the speckled rooster. For an instant they both remained motionless, and then the yellow hen shook her wings to settle the feathers and walked toward the door with a strut of proud defiance and cluck of victory. When the speckled rooster limped away to the group of other chickens, trailing his crumpled plumage in the dust as he went. "'Why, Bellina!' cried Dorothy in a shocked voice. "'Have you been fighting?' "'I really think I have,' retorted Bellina. "'Do you think I'd let that speckled villain of a rooster lord it over me "'and claim to run this chicken house as long as I am able to peck and scratch? "'Not if my name is Bill. "'But it isn't Bill, it's Bellina, and you're talking slang which is very indignified,' "'said Dorothy reprovingly. "'Come here, Bellina, and I'll let you out, "'for Ozma of Oz is here and has set us free.' So the yellow hen came to the door, which Dorothy unlatched for her to pass through, and the other chickens silently watched them from their corner without offering to approach nearer. The girl lifted her friend in her arms and exclaimed, "'Oh, Bellina, how dreadful you look! You've lost a lot of feathers, and one of your eyes is nearly pecked out, and your comb is bleeding!' "'That's nothing,' said Bellina. "'Just look at the speckled rooster. Didn't I do it to—' uh, "'Didn't I do him up brown?' Dorothy shook her head. I don't prove this, not at all, she said, carrying Bellina away toward the palace. It isn't a good thing for you to associate with those common chickens. They would soon spoil your good manners, and you wouldn't be respectable any more. I didn't ask to associate with them, replied Bellina. 
It is that cross old princess who was to blame. But I was raised in the United States, and I won't allow any one-horse chicken of the land of Ev to run over me and put on airs as long as I can lift a claw into fun in self-defense. Very well, Belina, said Dorothy. You won't talk about it any more. Soon they came to the cowardly lion and the hungry tiger to whom the girl introduced the yellow hen. Glad to meet any friend of Dorothy's, said the lion politely. To judge by your present appearance, you are not a coward as I am. Your present appearance makes my mouth water, said the tiger, looking at Bellina greedily. My, my, how good you would taste if I could only crunch you between my jaws. Don't worry, you would only appear uh, appease my appetite for a moment, so it isn't worth while to eat you. Thank you, said the hen, nestling closer in Dorothy's arms. Besides, it wouldn't be right, continued the tiger, looking steadily at Belina and clicking his jaws together. Of course not, cried Dorothy. Belina is my friend, and you mustn't ever eat her under any circumstances. I'll try to remember that, said the tiger, but I'm a little absent-minded at times. Then Dorothy carried her pet into the drawing room of the palace, where Tick-Tock, being in being invited to do so by Ozma, had seated himself between the scarecrow and the tin woodman. Opposite to them sat Ozma herself and the princess Languideer, and beside them there was a vacant chair for Dorothy. Around this important group was ranged the army of Oz, and as Dorothy looked at the handsome uniforms of the twenty-seven, she said, Why, there seem, uh, they seem to be all officers. Well, they are all except one, answered the tin woodman. I have in my army eight generals, six colonels, seven majors, and five captains, besides one private for them to command. I'd like to promise the private, for I believe no private should ever be in public life, and I've no notice that officers usually fight, uh, and I've also noticed that officers usually fight better and are more reliable than common soldiers. Besides, the officers are more important-looking and lend dignity to our army. No doubt you are right, said Dorothy, seating herself beside Ozma. And now, announced the girlish ruler of Oz, we will hold a solemn conference to decide the best manner of liberating the royal family of this fair land of Ev from their long imprisonment. Chapter 9 The Royal Family of Ev the tin woodman was the first to address the meeting. To begin with, said he, word came to our noble and illustrious ruler, Ozma of Oz, that the wife and ten children, five boys and five girls, of the former king of Ev, by name Evoldo, have been enslaved by the gnome king and are held prisoner in this his underground palace. Also, that there was no one in Ev powerful enough to release them. Naturally, our Ozma wished to undertake the adventure of liberating the poor prisoners, but for a long time she could find uh, she could find no way to cross the great desert between the two countries. Are you going to come up? Come on. Snockings. Are you going to come into my lap or are you just going to perch there? There we go. Sorry about the delay. Naturally, our Ozma wished to undertake the adventure of liberating the p poor prisoners, but for a long time she could find no way to cross the great desert between the two countries. Finally, she went to a friendly sorceress of our land named Glinda the Good, who heard the story and at once presented Ozma a magic carpet, which would continually unroll between, uh, beneath our feet and so make a comfortable fa path for us to cross the desert. As soon as she had received the carpet, our gracious ruler ordered me to assemble our army, which I did. You behold in these bold warriors the pick of all the finest soldiers of Oz, and, if we are obliged to fight the Gnome King, every officer, as well as the private, will battle fiercely unto death. Then Tick-Tock spoke. Why should you fight the Gnome King? he asked. He has done no wrong. No wrong, cried Dorothy. Isn't it wrong to imprison a queen mother and her ten children? They were sold to the gnome king by King Evoldo, replied Tick-Tock. It was the king of Ev who did wrong. 
and when he realized that uh, what he had done, he jumped into the sea and drowned himself. This is news to me, said Ozma thoughtfully. I had supposed the Gnome King was all to blame in the matter, but in any case, he must be made to liberate the prisoners. My uncle King of Oldo is a very wicked man, declared the Princess Languideer. If he had drowned himself before he sold his family, no one would have cared. But he sold them to the powerful Gnome King in exchange for a long life and afterwards destroyed the life by jumping into the sea. Then, said Ozma, he did not get the long life and the Gnome King must give up the prisoners. Where are they confined? No one knows exactly, replied the princess. For the king, whose name is Rok uh, Rokwat of the Rocks, owns a splendid palace underneath the great mountain which is at the north end of this kingdom, and he has transformed the queen and her children into ornaments and bric-a-brac -brac with which to decorate his rooms. I'd like to know, said Dorothy, who this gnome king is. I will tell you, replied Ozma. He is said to be the ruler of the underground world and commands the rocks and all that the rocks contain. Under this, his rule are many thousands of the gnomes who were queerly shaped but powerful sprites that labor at the furnaces and forges of their king, making gold and silver and other metals which they conceal in the crevices of the rocks so that those living upon the earth's surface can only find them with great difficulty. Also, they make diamonds and rubies and emeralds, which they hide in the ground, so that the kingdom of the gnomes is wonderfully rich, and all we have of precious stones and silver and gold is what we take from the earth and rocks where the gnome king has hidden them. I understand, said Dorothy, nodding her little head wisely. For the reason that we are off... Uh, for the reason that we often steal this his treasure, continued Ozma, the ruler, the, the ruler of the underground world is not fond of those who live upon the earth's surface, and never appears among us. If we wish to see King Roquat of the Rocks, we must visit his own country, where he is all-powerful, and therefore it will be a dangerous undertaking. But for, for the sake of the poor prisoners, said Dorothy, we ought to do it. We shall do it, replied the Scarecrow, although it requires a lot of courage for me to go near the furnaces of the Gnome King, for I am only stuffed with straw, and a single spark of fire might destroy me entirely, although if we remember from the marvelous land of Oz, the Scarecrow is now stuffed with money. The furnaces will also melt my tin, said the Tin Woodman, but I am going. I can't bear heat, remarked the Princess Languideer, yawning lazily. So I shall stay at home, but I wish you many, uh, I wish you may have success in your undertaking, for I am heartily tired of ruling this stupid kingdom, and I need more leisure in which to admire my beautiful heads. We do not need you, said Ozma, for if with the aid of my brave followers I cannot accomplish my purpose, then it would be useless for you to undertake the journey. Quite true, sighed the princess. So if you'll excuse me, I will now retire to my cabinet. I've worn this head quite a while, and I want to change it for another. When she had left them, and you may be sure no one was sorry to see her go, Ozma said to Tick-Tock, Will you join our party? I am the slave of the girl Dorothy, who rescued me from prison, replied the machine. Where she goes, I will go. Oh, I'm going with my friends, of course, said Dorothy quickly. I wouldn't miss the fun for anything. Will you go too, Belina? To be sure, said Belina in a careless tone. She was smoothing down the feathers of her back and not paying much attention. Heat is just in her line, remarked the scarecrow. If she is nicely roasted, she will be better than ever. Then, said Ozma, we will arrange to start for the Gnome Kingdom at daybreak tomorrow, and in the meantime, we will rest and prepare ourselves for the journey. Although Princess Languideer did not again appear to her guests, the palace servants waited upon the strangers from Oz and did everything in their power to make the party com comfortable. There were many vacant rooms in their disposal, and the brave army of the Twenty-Seven was easily provided for and liberally feasted. The cowardly lion and the hungry tiger were unharnessed from the chariot and allowed to roam at will throughout the palace, where they nearly frightened the servants into fits, although they did no harm at all. 
at one time, sorry, Snockings is in the way, at one time Dorothy Fawn uh, found the little maid Nanda crouching in terror in a corner with the hungry tiger standing beside her. You certainly look delicious, the beast was saying. Will you kindly give me permission to eat you? No, 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 replied the maiden, re uh, cried the maiden reply. Then, said the tiger, yawning frightfully, please to get me about 30 pounds of tenderloin steak cooked rare with a speck of boiled potatoes on the side and five gallons of ice cream for dessert. I I'll do the best I can, said Nanda, and she ran away as fast as she could go. Are you so very hungry? asked Dorothy in wonder. You can hardly imagine the size of my appetite, replied the tiger sadly. It seems to fill my whole body from the end of my throat to the tip of my tail. I am very sure the appetite doesn't fit me, and it's too large for the size of my body. Some day, when I meet a dentist with a pair of forceps, I'm going to have it pulled. What, your tooth? asked Dorothy. No, my appetite, said the hungry tiger. The little girl spent most of the afternoon talking with the scarecrow and the tooden woodman, who related to her all that had taken place in the land of Oz since Dorothy had left it. She was much interested in the story of Ozma, who had been, when a baby, stolen by a wicked old witch had, uh, and transformed into a boy. She did not know that she had ever been a girl until she, had restored, uh, she was restored to her natural form by a kind sorceress. Then it was found that she was the only child of the former ruler of Oz, and was entitled to rule in his place. Ozma had many adventures, however, before she regained her father's throne, and in the, these she had accompanied, uh, she was accompanied by a pumpkin-headed man, a highly magnified and thoroughly educated wogglebug, and a wonderful sawhorse that had been brought to life by means of a magic powder. The Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman had also assisted her, but the Cowardly Lion, who ruled the great forest of the king as the King of Beasts, knew nothing of Ozma until after she became the reigning Princess of Oz. Then he journeyed to the Emerald City to see her, and on hearing she was about to visit the land of Ev to set free the royal family of that country, the Cowardly Lion begged to go with her, and brought along his friend, the Hungry Tiger, as well. Having heard his story, Dorothy related to them her own adventures, and then went out with her friends to find the sawhorse, which Ozma had caused to be shod with plates of gold, so that its legs would not wear out. They came upon the sawhorse standing motionless beside the garden gate, but when Dorothy was introduced to him, he bowed politely and blinked his eyes, which were knots of wood, and wagged his tail, which was only the branch of a tree. "'What a remarkable thing to be alive!' exclaimed Dorothy. "'I quite agree with you,' replied the sawhorse with a rough but not unpleasant voice. "'A creature like me has no business to live, as we all know. "'But it was the magic powder that did it, so I cannot just, uh, justly be blamed.' "'Of course not,' said Dorothy. "'And you seem to be of some use, because I noticed the, the scarecrow riding upon your back.' Oh, yes, I'm of use, returned the sawhorse, and I never tire, never have to be fed or cared for in any way. Are you intelligent? asked the girl. Not very, said the creature. It would be foolish to waste intelligence on a common sawhorse, when so many professors need it. But I know enough to obey my masters and to get up or woe when I'm told to, so I'm pretty well satisfied. That night, Dorothy slept in a pleasant little bedchamber next to that occupied by Ozma of Oz, and Belina perched upon the foot of the bed and tucked her head under her wing and slept so soundly in that position as Dorothy, uh, as did Dorothy upon her soft cushions. But before daybreak, every one was awake and stirring, and soon the adventurers were eating hasty breakfast in the dining, great dining room of the palace. Ozma sat at the head of the long table on a raised platform, with Dorothy on her right hand and the Scarecrow on her left. The Scarecrow did not eat, of course, but Ozma placed him near to her, so that she might ask his advice about the journey while she ate. 
Lower down the table were the twenty-seven warriors of Oz, and at the end of the room, the lion and tiger were eating out of a kettle that had been placed upon the floor, while Belina fluttered around to pick up any scraps that might be scattered. It did not take long to finish the meal, and when the lion and the tiger were harnessed to the chariot, and the party was ready to start for the Gnome King's palace, first rode Ozma, with Dorothy beside her in the golden chariot, and holding Belina fast in her arms. Then came the scarecrow on the sawhorse, with the tin woodman and Tick-Tock marching side by side, just behind him. After these tramped the army, looking brave and handsome in his splendid uniforms. The generals commanded the colonels, and the colonels commanded the majors, and the majors commanded the captains, and the captains commanded the private, who marched with an air of proud importance because it required so many officers to give him his orders. And so the magnificent procession left the palace and started along the road just as day was breaking, and by the time they, the sun came up they had made good progress toward the valley that led to the Gnome King's domain. Chapter 10. The Giant with the Hammer The road led for a time through a pretty farm country, and then past a picnic road that was very inviting, but the procession continued to steadily advance until Melina cried in an uh, abrupt and commanding manner, Wait! Wait! Ozma stopped her chariot so suddenly that the scarecrow sawhorse nearly ran into it and the ranks of the armor, uh, army tumbled over one another before they could come to a halt. Immediately, the yellow hen struggled from Dorothy's arms and flew into a clump of bushes by the roadside. "'What's the matter?' called the tin wood anxiously. "'Why, Belina wants to lay her eggs, that's all,' said Dorothy. "'Lay her egg?' repeated the tin woodman in astonishment. "'Yes, she says one lays, uh, she lays one every morning about this time, and it's quite fresh,' said the girl." But does your foolish old hen suppose that this entire cavalcade, which is bound on an important adventure, is going to stand still while she lays her egg? inquired the tin woodman earnestly. What else can she do? asked the girl. It's a habit of Belina's, and she can't break herself of it. Then she must hurry up, said the tin woodman impatiently. No, no, exclaimed the scarecrow. If she hurries, she may lay scrambled eggs. That's nonsense, Dorothy. Uh, said, but Belina won't be long for sure. So they stood and waited, although all were restless and anxious to proceed. And by and by the yellow hen came from the bushes, saying, What is she doing, singing her, singing her egg? asked the scarecrow. Forward, march! shouted the tin woodman, waving his axe, and the procession started just as Dorothy had once uh, had once more grabbed Belina in her arms. "'Isn't anyone going to get my egg?' cried the hen in great excitement. "'I'll get it,' said the scarecrow, and at his command the sawhorse pranced into the bushes. The straw man soon found the egg which she placed in his jacket pocket. The cavalcade, having moved rapidly on, was even then far in advance, but it did not take the scarecrow long to catch up, and presently the scarecrow was riding in an accustomed in his accustomed place behind Ozma's chariot. "'What shall I do with the egg?' he asked Dorothy. "'I do not know,' the girl answered. "'Perhaps the hungry tiger would like it.' "'It would not be enough to fill one of my back teeth,' remarked the tiger. "'A bushel of them, hard-boiled, might take a little of the edge off my appetite, but one egg isn't good for anything at all that I know of.' "'No, it wouldn't even make a sponge cake,' said the scarecrow thoughtfully. The tin woodman might carry it with his axe and hatchet, but after all, I may as well keep it myself for a souvenir. So he left it in his pocket. They had now reached the part of the valley that they uh, that lay between the two high mountains which Dorothy had seen from her tower window. At the far end was the third great mountain which blocked the valley and was the north uh, end was the northern edge of the land of Ev. It was underneath this mountain that the Gnome King's palace was said to be, but it would be some time before they reached that place. The path was becoming rocky and difficult for the wheels of the chariot to pass over, and presently a deep gulf appeared at their feet, 
which was too wide for them to leap. So Ozma took a small square of green cloth from her pocket and threw it upon the ground. At once it became the magic carpet and unrolled itself far enough for all the cavalcade to walk upon. The chariot now advanced, and the green carpet unrolled before it, crossing the gulf on a level with its banks, so that all passed over in safety. "'That's easy enough,' said the scarecrow. "'I wonder what will happen next.' He was not long in making the discovery, for the sides of the mountain came together, uh, came closer together until finally there was but a narrow path between them, along which Ozma and her party were forced to pass in single file. They now heard a low and deep thump, 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 which echoed throughout the valley and seemed to grow louder as they advanced. Then, turning a corner of rock, they saw before them a huge form which towered above the path for more than a hundred feet. The form was that of a gigantic man built out of plates of cast iron, and it stood with one foot on either side of the narrow road and swung over its right shoulder an immense iron mallet with which it con constantly pounded the earth. These resounding blows examined, uh, explained the thumping sounds they had heard for the mallet was much bigger than a barrel, and where it struck the path between the rocky sides of the mountain, it filled all the space through which was our travelers could be obliged to pass. Of course, they at once halted a safe distance away from the terrible iron mallet. The magic carpet would do them no good in this case, for it was only meant to protect them from any dangers upon the ground beneath their feet, and not from the dangers that appeared in the air above them. Wow! said the cowardly lion with a shudder. It makes me dreadfully nervous to see that big hammer pounding so near my head. One blow would crush me into a doormat. The iron giant is a fine fellow, said Tick-Tock, and work is as steadily as a clock. He was made from uh, before the Gnome King by Smith and Tinker, who made me, and his duty is to keep folks from finding the underground palace. Is he not a great work of art? Can he think and speak as you do? asked Ozma, regarding the giant with wondering eyes. No, replied the machine. He is only made to pound the road, and has no thinking or speaking attachment. But he pounds very well, I think. Too well, observed the scarecrow. He is keeping his f he is keeping us from going further. Is there no way to stop his machinery? Only the Gnome King, who has the key, can do that, answered Tick-Tock. Then, said Dorothy Andrew, anxiously, what shall we do? Excuse me for a minute, said the Scarecrow, and I, th and I will think it over. He retired then to a position in the rear, where he, where he turned his painted face to the rocks and began to think. Meantime, the giant continued to raise his iron mallet high in the air and to strike the path terrific blows that echoed through the mountains like the roar of a cannon. Each time the mallet lifted, however, there was a moment when the path seemed beneath the monster was free, and perhaps the scarecrow had noticed this, for when he came back to the others, he said, The matter is a very simple one, after all. We have but to run under the hammer, one at a time, and when it is lifted, and pass to the other side before it falls again. It will require quick work if we escape the blow, said the tin woodman with a shake of his head. But it really seems the only thing to be done. Who will make the first attempt? They looked at one another hesitantly for a moment. Then the cowardly lion, who was trembling like a leaf in the wind, said to them, I suppose the head of the procession must go first, and that's me, but I'm terribly afraid of the big hammer. That what will become of me? asked Ozma. You might rush under the hammer yourself, but the chariot would surely be crushed. We must leave the chariot, said the scarecrow. But you two girls can ride upon the backs of the lion and the tiger. So this was decided upon, and Ozma, as soon as the lion was unfastened from the chariot, at once mounted the beast's back and said she was ready. Cling fast to my, his mane, advised Dorothy. I used to ride him myself, and that's the way I held on. So Ozma clung fast to the mane, and the lion crouched in the path and eyed the swinging mallet carefully until he knew just the instant it would begin to rise in the area, in the air. 
Then, before anyone thought he was ready, he made a sudden leap straight between the, the iron giant's legs, and before the mallet struck the ground again, the lion and Ozma were safe on the other side. The tiger went next. Dorothy sat upon his neck, uh, his back and locked her arms around his striped neck, for she, he had no mane to cling to. He made the leap straight and true as an arrow from a bow, and ere Dorothy realized it, she was out of danger and standing by Ozma's side. Now came the scarecrow on the sawhorse, and while they made the dash in safety, they were within a hair's breadth of being caught by the descending hammer. Tick-Tock walked up to the very edge of the spot the hammer struck, and as it was raised for the ninth, next blow, he calmly stepped forward and escaped its descent. That was an idea for the Tin Woodman to follow, and he also crossed in safety while the great hammer was in the air. But when it came to the twenty-seven officers and the private, their knees were so weak that they could not walk a step. In battle we are wonderfully courageous, said one of the generals, and our foes find us very terrible to face. But war is one thing, and this is another. When it comes to being pounded upon the head of an iron hammer and smashed into pancakes, we naturally object. Make a run for it, urged the scarecrow. Our knees shake so that we cannot run, answered a captain. If we should try it, we would all certainly be pounded to jelly. Well, well, sighed the cowardly lion. I see my friend Tiger that we must place ourselves in great danger to rescue this bold army. Come with me and we will do the best we can. So Ozma and Dorothy, having already dismounted from their backs, the lion and the tiger leapt back again under the, the awful hammer and returned with two generals clinging to their necks. They repeated this daring passage twelve times when all the officers had been gary, carried beneath the giant. Oh, sorry. When all of the officers had been carried beneath the giant's legs and landed safely on the other side. By that time, the beasts were very tired and panted so hard that their tongues hung out of their great mouths. But what is to become of the private? asked Ozma. Oh, leave them there to card the chariot, said the lion. I am tired out and won't pass in under that mallet again. The officers at once protested that they must have the private with them, else there would be no one for them to command. But neither the lion or the tiger would go after them, and so the scarecrow sent the sawhorse. Either the wooden horse was careless, or it failed to properly time the descent of the hammer, for the mighty weapon caught it squarely upon its head and thumped it against the ground so powerfully that the private flew off its back high into the air and landed upon one of the giant's cast-iron arms. Here he clung desperately while the arm rose and fell with each one of the rapid strokes. The scarecrow dashed in to rescue his sawhorse and had his left foot smashed by the hammer before he could pull the creature out of, sa out of danger. They then found that the sawhorse had been badly dazed by the blow, for while the hard wooden knot of which his head was formed could not be crushed by the hammer, both his ears were broken off and he would be a unable to hear a sound until some new ones were made for him. Also, his left knee was cracked and had to be bound up with a string. Belina, having fluttered under the hammer, at, it now remained only to rescue the private who was riding upon the iron giant's arm, high in the air. The scarecrow lay flat upon the ground and called to the man to jump down upon his body, which was soft because it was stuffed with straw. This the private managed to do, waiting until the time when he was nearest the ground, and then letting himself drop upon the scarecrow. He accomplished the feat without breaking any bones, and the scarecrow declared he was not injured in the least. Therefore, the tin woodman, having by this time fitted new ears to the sawhorse, the entire party proceeded upon its way, leaving the giant to pound the path behind them. I believe we have reached um, the end of our stream today. I had, uh, yeah, I don't know what happened to my um, bookmark that I had in place, but I definitely remember the chapter title of this, so I think we might have gone a little over even. 
Uh, anyways, I'm going to end the story time stream right now, but I'm going after taking a little break, I'm going to start up a game stream with the room three, and this is uh, the second playthrough that I'm going to be starting today. So I hope that you'll stick around. If you don't, that is fine. I hope to see you next time. And as soon as I know my schedule, I will let you know what uh, the story time is going to be next week. Anyways, thanks for staying and listening, and I'll see you next time. Bye.